My name's Larry Coleman, and I'll be your host as we take a look at one of the greatest athletes and humanitarians of our time, Paul Anderson, a man many historians believe is the strongest man who has ever walked on Earth. Our story starts in the midst of the Great Depression in a small town located in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. The town was Tekoa, situated in extreme northeastern Georgia, where the Appalachian Mountains have their humble beginnings. And the date was October the 17th of 1932, when Ethel Anderson gave birth to a nine pound, four ounce baby boy named Paul Edward. For Bob and Ethel, this was their second child, giving their daughter Dot a little brother. Before Paul was two, his father, a construction worker, moved the family to Franklin, North Carolina, where he'd found work with a Civilian Conservation Corps camp. And by age six, they had moved to Murphy, North Carolina, where Bob Anderson began work with the Tennessee Valley Authority. It was about this time that young Paul was stricken with Bright's disease, a chronic inflammation of the kidneys that can lead to end-stage kidney failure later in life. He was admitted to the hospital in a coma, but miraculously recovered and was finally allowed to return to school with the others, but with orders to restrict his activities. Bob Anderson's work took the family back to Tacoa in 1941, to a little town in Tennessee in 1942, and back to Tacoa in time for Paul to start fourth grade. Though his father still found it necessary to travel, the family was able to stay in Tacoa with his father coming home on the weekends. This situation continued till Paul's last year of high school, when his mother and father moved to Elizabethton, Tennessee. Paul, however, remained in Tacoa moving in with his sister Dot and her husband, Julius Johnson, so that he could graduate with his friends at Tacoa High. By the time Paul entered high school, he began putting on some weight, was playing football, was a class officer, member of the Letterman's Club, and only one of three in high school who had a car. In Paul's own words, he'd become part of the in crowd. We went to Tacoa, Georgia, and talked with several of its citizens who remember going to high school with Paul Anderson some 40 years ago. Paul weighed 175, 80 pounds in about the eighth grade. He was uh, always around high school. I know he was uh, our last year in school. He was the fastest man on our team as far as uh, running in a sprint or a dash. He weighed about 195 pounds when he was about 17, 16, 17 years old. Uh, we ran the single wing and Paul was a guard up until the senior year, and they moved him to blocking back. And I played center, and uh, on defense, Paul played guard. But he was uh, he was a heart and soul of our football team. As far as uh, he was real good in anything he went at, but he was his uh, he played fair, but he was real tough well thought of and he was always jolly and happy. I never seen him mad. I didn't want to see him mad, to tell you the truth. He was always uh, real friendly with everybody, everybody's friend. But in high school, I would say that uh, I remember Paul for the most part. In football, the amazing thing was, uh, and right or wrong, this is the memory that I have, was that uh, his size came rather rapidly during those years. And what I do remember was with his size was the tremendous agility and speed that he had. I can remember on sprints that Paul was one of the ones always out front and across the line first. And uh, yet with that tremendous size and uh, power that he had, it's an amazing situation. As far as the way I remember Paul, and I'm probably not the loudest one around, nor was he the quietest. Personality-wise, likable. Uh, high school generally, everybody belongs to a clique here or there or whatever, but as I remember, he, Paul was pretty well liked by all, and uh, his personality was very open, warm. The problem with Paul in football was that he was small, played in the line. I was a back and supposed to be pretty fast. 
But Paul was too quick. He was a lot faster than most of the backs, and so we didn't want to run wind sprints against him. You'd try to get him off on somebody else. But when Paul was in school, I would not have picked him to be the strongest man in the world. I knew that he had some speed and strength, but um, Paul was not unusually big. He began to grow um, in 46, 47, I think it was, when we first started putting the uniform on him. and. Uh, he looked just about like some of the smaller members of the team, and only in his senior year did he begin to, uh, his uh, features began to show a lot of strength and all coming to him. So I think that when I would look at him, I would might have recognized he had some talents and some other abilities, but I would not have put him to go from there. But I believe that perhaps he took what uh, nature had, or what the Lord maybe had given him to work with, and uh, built on it and came across it from there rather than it being obviously a gift. He, he developed a lot of it from there. So it was not obvious when we were in school that he was going to be what he turned out to be as far as the strength goes. Though most in the small town remember Paul as being much stronger than anyone else in high school and thus his nickname Little Atlas, no one remembers ever thinking that he might develop into the strongest man on earth. Surprising also was that most remembered how fast and agile the big boy was while playing football during his last two years at Tekoa High. Others know this young boy's athletic skills, including Furman University, who promptly offered Paul a football scholarship. So the young lad from Tekoa packed his bags and traveled to Greenville, South Carolina, where he entered the small college. Before the school year was over, however, Paul left Furman and returned to stay with his parents in Elizabethton, Tennessee. Some say that the college, though they fed their athletes well, were unable to satisfy Paul's appetite. But Paul has stated that he'd become bored with school and football and had gone back home to rethink what he wanted to do. Though Paul had lifted weights in high school and college with the other athletes, no one remembers Paul seriously training with weights. Most just remember the young man as one of the boys. All this would change, however, shortly after leaving Furman and returning to Elizabethton to stay with his parents. The first written acknowledgement of Paul Anderson, the weightlifter, came in the February 1952 issue of Iron Man magazine, written by Bob Peoples of Johnson City, Tennessee. Bob Peoples, a world-renowned weightlifter himself, held the national and world record in the deadlift for over 25 years, a record he had set in March of 1949 when at 180 pounds he deadlifted 725 and three-quarter pounds. In the 1952 article, Peoples described how the 19-year-old Paul, who was living in nearby Elizabethton with his parents, arrived one day to meet the popular Peoples. Peoples took the lad downstairs into a cellar, where Peoples had built a makeshift weight room, a room Anderson thereafter referred to as the dungeon because of its dark and gloomy appearance. Once in the cellar, the boyish Paul, wearing tennis shoes and using no supports or wraps and without any warm-up, promptly squatted 550 pounds two times with relative ease. Peoples was astounded, for he knew that the world record was only around 575 pounds and that record had been standing for 30 years. The 19-year-old Paul stood 5 feet 10 inches tall, weighed 275 pounds, and had a 21 and a half inch neck, 20-inch arms, 50-inch chest, 42-inch waist, 33-inch thighs, and 19-inch calves. The 1952 article described Paul as a new strength discovery. Peoples, who still lives in the same house some 40 years later, vividly remembers the first time in the summer of 1952 that he met Paul Anderson. Well, a fellow named Bob Taylor I met Paul Anderson in, when they moved to Elizabeth. He brought him over, and, uh, and he, was, uh, he weighed about 260. At that time, was about 19 years old. And... Uh, so we went down, which later Paul named the dungeon, and uh, to see what he could do. And I asked him what he wanted to do, and he said he'd like to do a squat, and he was good on that. And so I asked him how much weight he wanted, and he said 
500 pounds. I said, you want to warm up? He said, no. Just load it up. And so I loaded it to 500 pounds, and he did it with all ease. He just uh, made a perfect squat all the way through, locked out at the bottom and come back. And then we put 550 on it, and he did that with all ease. In the meantime, my wife came in, and I called her down and asked him to do it again for her, and which he did. He was getting close on all of them. I knew that he could break all the records if he wanted to, and he seemed to take a great interest in it and want to pursue it. And so he did right on through, and we put on a little exhibition in Johnson City when they opened a service station. <coughs> And uh, he squatted with over 700 pounds. The first meet for the young Paul was in September of 1952 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the Mr. World Contest. In the meet, Paul broke a world's record, but it was not officially recognized for Paul was not listed as a lifter. It was only allowed to lift because he had driven so far to get there. Later, Paul participated in his first competitive lift in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and made lifting history when he promptly squatted 605, 635, and then 650 pounds with only a few moments rest between the lifts. When the 650 pounds was officially weighed, it proved to be 660 and one half pounds, the greatest weight that had ever been squatted by a human being. Paul Anderson, at 20 years of age, had broken the 30-year squatting record by over 60 pounds. In the same meet, the young lad, after only several months practicing the three Olympic lifts, totaled 800 pounds, breaking most of the existing Southern records. Those at the Chattanooga meet described as three Olympic lifts as phenomenal for so crude of style. It was around this time that Paul first started going to Norfolk, Virginia, to what was commonly referred to as Kelowna's Picnic. The name most surely arose from the fact that most who showed up for the outdoor event usually brought box meals with them for the all-day event. Jack Hughes, the 1953 123-pound weightlifting champion and now an international weightlifting referee, remembers seeing Paul Anderson lift at one of the early get-togethers just outside of Norfolk. Well, the, the most impressive thing I remember of the man was how big he was. Because <laughs> in those days, you didn't see big men. You know, I mean, you've seen tall men, but not big men. See? And at the, uh, the contest, we just, uh, uh, oh, I'd say, even though it was a sanctioned contest, it was more like a pickup contest, because everybody from everywhere came to the contest, see? And uh, even the from where I had to come from, it took us an all-day drive to get there without no freeways or nothing, you know? And we still would drive down to the place, you know? And then drive back after the contest was over all night long. Anyway, uh, I can't even remember what the man lifted, but it was impressive because every time he lifted, everybody's brother stopped talking or whatever to watch the man lift because they'd never seen this heavy of a weight lifted before by any individual, see? And he was just beginning then, see? He'd never, he wasn't a national champion yet, see? He was a terrific man, see? By July of 1953, Paul had moved his squat up to over 762 pounds, some 97 pounds more than any other human. Two months later, at the All Dixie Meet again in Chattanooga, he pressed 352 pounds for a national record. In October of 1953, the first movie footage ever taken of Paul Anderson was taken at an international meet held in Montreal, Canada, where he took first place, setting a new Canadian Open record. Paul Anderson of the USA lifts 330 pounds on his first try at a body weight of 310. Anderson handles 402 pounds, the new champ, and brother, he can really toss his weight around. A month later, he traveled to York, Pennsylvania, 
where he set a new world record total of 1,065 pounds in the three Olympic lifts, beating a record that had taken dozens of years for eight-time world and Olympic champion John Davis to achieve. By now, he was squatting with 820 pounds, more than 200 pounds better than world champion Doug Hepburn of Canada. In addition, he had increased his body weight to 300 pounds with 21-inch arms, 16-inch forearms, 23-inch neck, 58-inch chest, and 34-inch thighs. 1954 proved disastrous for Paul when he injured his leg while working out with a 3,500-pound safe he'd been using in a hip lift to build overall strength. Apparently, Paul had lifted the safe many times in the past, but late one evening strained himself trying to pull the massive safe only to find out later the safe had frozen to the ground. Later, he broke his wrist in Indianapolis while trying for a new world record, and then as a passenger in a friend's car, broke several ribs and injured his hip when the vehicle ran off the road and smashed into a tree. Determined to not be slowed, Paul rebuilt the cast on his arm using steel supports and a rod that could be used to pull or push the weights so that he could continue working out. On February the 12th of 1955 in Washington, D.C., Paul Anderson reappeared on the scene and promptly put together history's first 1,100-pound total. Two months later, in April, at High Point YMCA in North Carolina, Paul performed the world's first official 400-pound press, pressing a barbell weighing 402 and a quarter pounds with what witnesses later described as ridiculously easy breaking the old record by more than 15 pounds. His total at the end of the day was a phenomenal 1,142 and a half pounds, 68 pounds in excess of the official world record. Herb Glossbrenner of Los Angeles, California, a world champion's lifter and highly renowned and respected powerlifting statistician who has been a national sports writer for the last 30 years, recounts where he first saw Paul Anderson. When I was a young boy, like all young boys need to find a role model, I went to a movie in the summer of 1955, June 1955, 13 years of age. And in those days, they had the newsreels. And suddenly, I was completely mesmerized by this sports figure which came up on the screen, of Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson was the most amazing human being I'd ever seen. You're talking about a man that it was what people thought a weightlifter should look like. He was about 5 feet 10 inches tall, weighed about 350 pounds, and was lifting weights that no human being had ever even imagined could be lifted. Uh, from that day on, I became completely uh, enraptured in the thought of a uh, sport of weightlifting, uh, strength, uh, human endeavor, and uh, Paul Anderson was my boyhood idol, and uh, for the past uh, 35 years, he has remained so. On June the 4th of 1955, at the Senior Nationals in Cleveland, Ohio, the 22-year-old Paul set yet another world's record by clean and jerking 436 and a half pounds. Witnesses at the Senior Nationals described the lifts as easy for Paul, and I quote, they had never seen such physical power. Have a look at Paul Anderson, the world's strongest man who tosses his weight around, a 400-pound weight. Nice going, Paul. What do you think about 435 pounds? Hmm. Paul strong arms his way to a new world's record, 436 and a half pounds, and brother, he really gets a lift out of it. Paul's performance in Cleveland won him a last-minute seat on an airplane leaving for the Soviet Union where the Americans would face off against the Russians. The Russians paid little attention as the heavy 23-year-old American fill-in walked off the plane. But after the competition held on the evening of June the 15th, the Russians and the world would be blasted with pictures and articles of the Georgia native, proclaiming him the strongest man on earth. In spite of a drizzling rain, 16,000 Russians packed into Gorky Park to watch the competition, pitting the Russians against the Americans. The crowd was exuberant when their heavyweight champion tied the Olympic record, 
with a press just over 330 pounds. The young man from the U.S. stepped up and had the bar loaded with 402 and a half pounds. The officials and audience were amused, for the Olympic record had just been tied at 330 pounds, and the all-time world's record was only 381 pounds. Who was this huge lifter, they asked themselves? Was this a joke? Did he really think he could possibly lift such a tremendous weight? The audience quickly drew quiet as the colossal American wrapped his hands around the bar and began to throw the weights up, and without expression, pushed the weights overhead as if they were toys. Anderson recalls that the whole park fell dead quiet and that all you could hear was the patter of the rain drizzling from overhead. After the crowd realized what they'd just seen, the silence was broken with a tremendous applause that shook the stage. One elderly Russian stated, I can die happy now. I have seen the greatest thing in history. Others treated him as a god and dubbed him Mr. America, the wonder of nature. The young man from Tekoa, Georgia, after only some 36 months of competitive lifting, had just broken the world record by 22 pounds, the biggest margin in history. Some Russians responded that the American's record should not be counted, for they insisted he was not a normal person. His imposing 340-pound figure that now sported a 23 and a half inch neck, 22 and quarter inch arms, 58 inch chest, 47 inch waist, and 36 inch thighs, coupled with the ease with which he lifted the world record weights, left more than the Russians all struck. For what people were seeing was a raw power such as had never been seen before, and what many people believe will never be seen again. To this day, the Russians hold high respect for the man who at Gorky Park set the new world record. Bob Hise of Los Angeles, California, an outstanding lifter in the 40s and founder of Maverick Barbell Company, the American Weightlifting Association, and founder and editor of the publication International Olympic Lifter, traveled to Russia in 1975 for the World Weightlifting Championships. Mr. Hise described to us how the Russians, some 20 years later, we're still paying great tribute to the American lifter from Georgia. Then I went to the World Weightlifting Championships in 75 in Moscow. And they held the World Championships in an ice rink. And it was a kind of a, uh, not a round, an oval shape. And uh, all around the outside, or the corridor, went all the way around this uh, ice rink, and they had pictures of famous weightlifters everywhere, American lifters and uh, uh, French lifters and German lifters and English and Egyptians, but Paul Anderson was the idol. I counted 144 pictures in this display of Paul Anderson. They, they were very uh, impressed with him, and of course the pictures the picture signified that what they thought of him. And they have always uh, honored and, and uh, <clears throat> felt that uh, extreme strength was uh, a very great asset in a human being. Back home, Paul had become a hero. A hero, many say, came along just at the right time for the United States. And a hero of the little town of Tekoa took great pride in claiming his heirs. Paul's return to the States after his Russian competition resulted in the townspeople of Tekoa driving to Atlanta to meet their hero as he came off the plane. When the caravan of vehicles arrived at the airport, however, they waited only to discover Paul had missed the flight. Ironically, stepping off the plane only to discover a disappointed crowd was Bob Hope. Hope did, however, take time to chat with the children before everyone returned to Tekoa empty-handed. Paul arrived later in the evening where a small crowd of die-hard reporters got a quick interview with the new strongman before he drove to Tekoa. The next day, the little town of Tekoa was alive with newspaper, magazine, radio, and television reporters finding their way to the home of the world's strongest man.
Anderson had been thrown into the spotlight, including a personal meeting with then-Vice President Richard Nixon. Georgia continued through 1955, setting new world records in lifting competitions held overseas as part of an American and U.S. Goodwill Ambassadors team. During the overseas trips, Paul continued to devastate records, like in Munich, Germany, where he set a new world's record press of 409 pounds and a new world's record total of 1,129 and a half pounds. The press record stood for 10 years. nations meet in Munich, 108 members of the International Beef Trust vying for the world's weightlifting championships. Bantamweights, featherweights, heavyweights, all stout men and true out to win glory for themselves and their countries. Canada's daily struggles mightily to lift some 250 pounds, the medium heavy's goal. Missed by that much. Good try. Russia's Arkady Vorobiev presses 290 pounds, a new medium heavyweight mark, good for the championship and the points to give Russia the team crown. Here's a heavyweight in action. Want to try it? That's where the glamour of the sport is, heavyweights. Korean War vet Jim Bradford of Washington, D.C. earns the number two spot, lifting some 1,047 pounds in three events. Now meet 22-year-old Paul Anderson, student of Tacoa, Georgia, a big man on campus, no doubt. That's that, a fantastic total of 1,030 pounds, 410 in the press alone for the world's championship. Quite a boy, that Paul Anderson. By now, the world press was paying close attention to the young man being labeled as the strongest man in the world, bringing news movie footage to theaters all over the country, where Americans sat spellbound as they watched the huge Georgian break record after record. It was images like these of Paul Anderson strutting onto the stage with legs and arms so huge that he had to waddle to the weights that left such a lasting memory in the minds of many people like Herb Glossbrenner. In Baghdad, he set yet another world's record by continental clean and jerking 457 and a half pounds, bettering the old record by 20 pounds and six and a half pounds better than the old two hands any manner record of 451 pounds that had stood for 55 years, a record set by Arthur Saxton in 1900. Once back in the States, the dismailing of world records continued, like in June of 1956 in Philadelphia, where he exceeded three more world records, pressing 400 pounds, snatching 335 pounds, clean and jerking 440 pounds for a new world record total of 1,175 pounds. He was most likely the first man in history to have clean and jerked 440 pounds but the stage was overrun with spectators before the weights could be officially weighed. Though all conditions were met for official world records, Paul's records were never submitted to the International Weightlifting Federation for official recognition. According to Herb Glossbrenner, and I quote, it was a most inexcusable act of negligence and disregard for this athlete as Paul's records were never submitted. Many believe this was by far the greatest singular performance of Paul's amateur career.
Association strongmen draw a small throng to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia for the National Senior Weightlifting Championships. It's hard work. Another contender tries and barely gets it off the floor. It's risky work, too. Chuck Vinci of York, Pennsylvania, defending title holder in the bantamweight class, lifted a combined total of 690 pounds in the three events to retain his crown. Fourth place in the Bantam Bruisers went to Dave Moyer of Reading, PA. Dave's been doing this for some time. That's a lot of load for anybody's knees to support. Here's a mountain of a man, Paul Anderson of Georgia, who thinks nothing of lifting over a half a ton in a meat. 440 pounds in the clean and jerk for a meat total of 1,175 pounds. Paul weighs 320 himself. Two new world records for Paul Anderson of Tacoa, Georgia. What a man. By October of 1956, Paul found himself in San Jose, California at the Olympic tryouts, easily winning a seat on the plane leaving from Melbourne, Australia, where the 1956 Olympic Games were to be played. The Russians were so sure he'd win, they did not even enter their heavyweight to compete. But what they and the others did not know was that Paul had become terribly sick and was running a temperature of 104 degrees. According to his own accounts in his autobiography, he began taking four aspirin every three hours without the tending physician's knowledge, was able to bring his temperature down enough that the doctors allowed him to enter the competition. Despite having lost some 40 pounds and being off balance from the sickness, Paul brought a gold medal back to the United States. Paul Anderson is the last American heavyweight lifter to ever win a gold medal in the Olympic Games for the United States. December of 1956, the team returned to the Los Angeles International Airport where Paul and the rest of the team emerged all smiles. For Paul Anderson, this would be the last time he'd speak to a large gathering as an amateur athlete. The first members of America's Olympic team arrive in exuberant return home. Gold medalist weightlifters Anderson and Vinci ganging up, the lightweight on top. Oarsman Jack Kelly lost as Russia swept the point scores. But in basketball, Big Bill Russell starred. Weightlifting, heavyweight Paul Anderson led the U.S. contingent. And in track and field, America dominated with 32 gold medals in all. Among the winners, Glenn Davis and Greg Bell. Tom Courtney, Charlie Dumas, Bob Richards. Barry O'Brien greeted by his family. Fine sportsmen all win or lose. Not long after returning home from the Olympics, Paul turned professional, accepting an offer to appear on the Ed Sullivan Show. Reflecting back on his decision, Paul stated in his autobiography, and I quote, these ventures altered my status from amateur to professional, which opened many doors for me to pursue fame and fortune as one of history's best known professional strongmen. It was good to be free of the restrictions, and I had no more amateur ambitions anyway. There was no sense in preparing for the 1960 Olympics if it meant four years of poverty. After only four years of competitive lifting, including the disastrous year of 1954, where Paul was plagued with injuries, the young man had established a phenomenal 18 American and nine world records. As an amateur, he retired as world, Olympic, and twice USA national champion. As a professional, he tried his hands at wrestling, boxing, and even the movies, but he never felt comfortable with any of these ventures.
As a professional lifter, he continued lifting phenomenal poundage just far in excess of any human on earth. In June of 1957, for example, he lifted 6,270 pounds in a back lift, a feat that many believe will never be equaled, and a feat that bettered the old record by more than 1,600 pounds. Also in 1957, he performed a tremendous show of strength during a strongman act in Vegas where he squatted two steel safes filled with 15,000 silver dollars with a combined weight of 1,160 pounds. Again, some 35 years later, no one has been able to equal the lift. And this was not performed once, but an act he did three times a night on Fane Muscle Beach in Santa Monica, California, in front of knowledgeable witnesses, Paul snatched over 540 pounds from a squat rack on the beach, lifting the weights overhead with little difficulty. Witnesses stated, and I quote, this was the greatest feat of strength most of us had ever seen. Noted publisher Bob Heiss witnessed Paul perform a one-arm side press, which weighed 380 pounds. I quote from Mr. Heise's own statement, I saw Paul do a one-arm side press with an enormous barbell which weighed 172.4 kilograms, 380 pounds. He continues, this is the most weight legitimately lifted with one arm from the shoulders overhead. This exceeds even the unofficial bent press record of old time professional strong men. In this footage, Paul does 300 pounds twice, and during another appearance, he does 240 pounds twice. Here the world's strongest man is lifting a 300 pound dumbbell, not just one time, but twice. As Lewis Sear gained world renown by hoisting the 208-pound Sear bell once over his head, Anderson raised a 240-pound weight over his head several times. He then showed the... We could go on and on reciting these lifts and stack article upon article atop one another or quote multitudes of lifters and riders, but something we have not looked at so far that deserves discussion is the times and manner in which these lifts were performed. The time of his amateur career was 1952 through 56. Knowledgeable experts will quickly point out to those who question whether or not steroids could have been used by Anderson, that steroids were not even available to US athletes during the 50s. In addition to steroids and other muscle and endurance enhancing drugs, modern science has brought to the lifter and other sports figures new information on diet and general health that 30 or even 15 years ago would have been described as totally revolutionary. Add to this the everyday use of high-speed cameras that have been coupled to computers that break down an athlete's movements into their smallest details, enabling minute adjustments never thought possible. There is no doubt that the young boy from Dakota was totally void of such equipment and health. Not only did he not have access to such equipment, but he never even had an officially trained coach. Sure, he received some sporadic tips from some of the old time lifters like Bob Peoples, but these encounters are best described as brief, with Paul doing the majority of his training in private within the confines of his parents' house located in Elizabethton, Tennessee, and later Toccoa, Georgia. While training during the early days and even right up to his appearance in Melbourne, Australia for the Olympic Games, Paul followed a routine that he had personally developed using homemade weights that many times came from the junkyard. One of the most famous pictures depicting Paul's equipment were those showing him working out with a set of iron wheels attached to a huge steel bar which he used in practicing his squats. Most on earth could not even squat down with the tremendous wheels once, but Paul squatted with the wheels on a daily basis over and over again, working with his huge 36 inch thighs. Other homemade weights show up in this old 1955 film footage taken during one of his daily workouts, such as these huge 55 gallon steel drums filled with concrete and weights suspended from a tree 
in the backyard with the use of chains. After witnessing his lifts personally or later on film, many describe Paul Anderson as just pure brute strength. Not only must we take into account the manner in which he threw the weights around, but we must look at the manner in which he prepared for these lifts and the supportive equipment he failed to take advantage of. Lifting experts cringe and shake their heads in amazement when they look at old photos and footage of Paul walking on stage and without any warm-up squat world record weight, wearing an old pair of tennis shoes, or worse yet, no shoes at all, and no knee wraps. In many photos, Paul was shown wearing street clothes and dress shoes, as if he had just walked off the street to try his hand at a lift. Today's lifting suits were non-existent during his time, and though available, very seldom did he wear a weightlifting belt. Later in life, he usually wore a pair of his favorite cowboy boots when squatting or doing his famous back lift that contained a table loaded with people. It is doubtful that any modern day lifter would even consider lifting record poundages without the use of specially designed shoes, knee wraps, belts, super suits, and other high tech accessories for the fear of permanently injuring themselves. Not only had Paul Anderson established himself unquestionably as the strongest man of his times, but he became the best known weightlifter in history. The huge Georgian had captured the attention and admiration of people from all walks of life all over the world. Anderson had popularized the sport of weightlifting and had given Americans a true hero they could be proud of. Many in the sport some 40 years later still describe Paul Anderson as their hero. Paul Anderson found himself sitting on top of the world. In September of 1959, Paul Anderson married the former Glenda Garden of Toccoa, Georgia. Within 20 months, Paul and Glenda were living out of a tiny motel room on the outskirts of the small rural southeastern town of Vidalia, Georgia. Newspapers throughout the country were reporting that the strongest man in the world was giving up his professional wrestling career and other ventures in order to establish a home that would help handicapped, troubled, and homeless children. Though it is doubtful we'll ever fully comprehend what led Paul and Glenda to the small town of Vidalia, we do know that an event took place during Paul's Olympic gold medal performance in Melbourne, Australia that would change his life forever. As we told you earlier, Paul had become terribly sick during his Melbourne trip and had been barely able to compete. What we did not tell you was that Paul began doubting whether he could even finish the competition. The strongest man in the world realized that he was also one of the weakest and began trying to pray. But as Paul stated in his autobiography, he was unable to pray, for his heart had grown cold from years of ignoring God. Facing certain defeat, Paul finally opened his heart to the Lord and promised he would become part of his kingdom. This event certainly altered Paul Anderson's life forever, for the strongest man on earth had just realized that his strength meant nothing without his accepting the love of Jesus Christ. As Paul would describe to his audiences later, he was the strongest man on earth, but he could not go one day without Jesus Christ. Let us listen to Paul's own words of what happened that day. I got up and walked off because I knew somehow I was not getting through. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to reach God. I didn't know the zip code, the area code, the number to dial. I didn't know Jesus Christ. Walked back to the stage, took the weight once again. Just had to go through this thing to show I was trying. I knew I couldn't make it, but I didn't get it to my chest again. Stood there, the greatest burden I've ever felt. I knew I couldn't move it, couldn't get it overhead. Desperation, I prayed. Two man, I just wait until the desperate moment to pray. And I waited, and I prayed, 
I don't know what I said verbatim, but I said something like, God, you've given me much. I return very little. You may be the strongest man in the world, and I can use my witness. I said, Lord, no matter what happens here, no matter what takes place, if there's anything left in old Paul Anderson, you won't. I'd like to be a part of your kingdom. To really be committed to Jesus Christ, God, let me be a part of your kingdom. No excuses, no. And no deals, Lord, no deals. But, uh, God, don't you think it'd be a good idea if we got this weight over here? <laughs> I pushed it away, went over here. I learned something there I want to elaborate on in just a moment. I learned that no matter who you are, strongest man in the world, richest man in the world, best looking girl in school, or best athlete, you can't make it without God. And the only way to reach God is through Jesus Christ. So think about this. Looking back, Paul was convinced God sent Glenda into his life to help him grow as a Christian. And he had then led Paul down what Paul describes as a long hallway with a door at the end. Behind that door was his work at the youth home. Faith certainly followed Paul to Vidalia when he met Jerry Achenbach, who was president of a huge chain of grocery stores. Jerry Achenbach was just the person Paul and Glenda needed to help them with their youth home plans. He was a well-respected businessman and a devoted Christian who could be depended on for sound business advice. Though Jerry Achenbach had never heard of Paul Anderson, he was so impressed with Paul's energy, enthusiasm, and sincerity, he agreed to join the Andersons, becoming the third member necessary for incorporating the youth home and to share his years of business experience with the young couple. Over 30 years later, Jerry Achenbach, who remains a firm supporter of the Anderson Youth Home, recounted his first meeting with Paul Anderson in 1961. Oh, well, Glenda was 19, as I recall, and fresh out of college and had no experience in the world at all. Paul was, I, I think his legitimate age was 27, although his athletic age was 23 or some such thing. But uh, they, they were very young, very inexperienced and naive in so many ways that, uh, that they needed some older head to, to kind of guide them. When he came into my office, and I didn't know him, but he presented such a sincere portrayal or vision of what he wanted to try to accomplish, I figured that if he was as sincere as he sounded, he needed help. For the next 20 years, Paul Anderson traveled extensively throughout the United States, appearing before as many as 500 audiences a year, raising money for the youth home as Glenda took care of the everyday duties at the home. Though Paul tried to stay at the home as much as possible, his grueling schedule kept him on the road most of the time. It was during Paul's speaking engagements that many people throughout the country saw the strongest man for the first time and saw firsthand his great strength. More important to Paul, however, was his opportunity to speak to others about his Christian faith. Whenever anyone mentioned seeing one of Paul's performances, they usually describe his squatting world record amounts of weight, lifting two and 300 pound dumbbells overhead with one arm holding 60-pound dumbbells out at arm's length with his little pinkies, or perhaps driving 10-penny nails through two-by-fours with his bare hands. But they also mention his Christian values. In addition to helping those who came through the doors of his youth home, Paul Anderson was changing lives through his performances across the country. Having this opportunity to present my feats of strength to entertain you is certainly something I count as a privilege. But for the next two or three or five minutes, let me just say some things that are dear to my heart. I have many privileges. I speak some 500 times a year and demonstrate my strength around the country and the world. I feel that my calling is to 
speak to young people, especially to demonstrate to them that it's not a sissy thing to be a Christian, to demonstrate to them that it's not old-fashioned to be a patriot, to embrace the basic principles of our land. I am a fortunate person. I'm a world and Olympic weightlifting champion. In other words, I am the very best in my chosen sport. It's a thrill to be an Olympic champion. When you win the Olympic Games, they put you up on a big pedestal, raise your flag, play your national anthem. A thrill. There are three and a half billion people on the face of the earth. They call me the strongest man in the world because I can lift over 6,000 pounds at one time more than anyone else has ever lifted. Now these things I say not boasting. I'm saying these things to make a point. Yes, it's a thrilling thing to be an Olympic champion called the strongest man in the world, but the greatest thrill in my life is being a Christian, having the opportunity to stand up witness for Jesus Christ. Now, friends, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. The greatest thing, yes, because God giving his son is the greatest thing that ever happened in the universe. So, if he lives in my heart, why, it's the greatest thing in my life. And I want to shout about it. You know what kind of bothers me sometimes? Clod kickers. You know people that stand up and say, oh, Christian, I'm not ashamed, Jesus Christ, all that mess. You should holler about it. And let me leave you with this thought. And I will not qualify the statement, I don't have time. But I am called the strongest man in the world. But I could not get through one day without Jesus Christ. So if Paul Anderson, more strength than anyone else around, has got to have God through his son Jesus Christ, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you don't have him, you're not making it at all. I used to think I was making it, but I couldn't make it for sure through one day without Jesus Christ. Thank you and God bless you. Retired Air Force General Dick Abel, who has served as past president of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and U.S. Olympic Committee, recounts Paul Anderson's performance years ago at the United States Air Force Academy where General Abel was serving as assistant coach. And then he took a ten-penny nail. Now, some of you ladies aren't carpenters, but that, that's ten nails to a pound. And he put the head of it in his hand, the palm of his hand, with the nail sticking out like this, and he had two one-inch boards there, and he goes, whoa, through both boards. Well, I have to tell you right then, I said, if he's selling used cars, I'm going to buy one. <laughs> I have never seen anything like that. And then he talked about winning the gold medal at the Olympics, about having it hung on his neck and the flag raised behind him and the national anthem played. He said, I've never been so proud to be an American. But the greatest thrill in my life is to know Jesus Christ as my personal savior. Ladies and gentlemen, here's a man that can walk down any alley in America. He had a 24 inch neck. I mean, who is going to mess with him? And yet the greatest thrill in his life was to know Jesus Christ. He said this, I'm the strongest man in the world, and I need Jesus Christ. Don't you think you do too? Lives were changed. In the mid-1960s, Pat Williams invited Paul Anderson to speak before one of his baseball games while Williams was president and general manager of the Spartanburg, South Carolina Phillies in the hopes of drawing in bigger crowds to the games. Pat Williams went on to become general manager of the Atlanta Hawks, Chicago Bulls, and 12 years with the Philadelphia 76ers. Williams is currently president and general manager of the Orlando Magic National Basketball Team in Orlando, Florida. And then, then one other thing I want to share with you. Uh, that, that has hit me, that Paul has impacted my life deeply, and that is, um, uh, it was through Paul Anderson primarily uh, that I became a Christian. 
uh, 25 years ago. Because that night I shared with you, we brought Paul to our ballpark to, to entertain our people, to draw a crowd, uh, to, to, in, to, to give them a good time. And he did that with those feats of strength. Uh, that's all he had to do that night. Uh, all he had to do was go back to his big Oldsmobile and head back to Vidalia that night. Uh, but before he did, uh, remember how I told you how his voice went booming out all over South Spartanburg? I mean, it went everywhere. It's still echoing through the trees 25 years later. I remember exactly what he said. He said, um, I am the strongest man ever to walk the face of this earth. He said, I've lifted more weight than anybody. He said, I'm included in the Guinness World Book of Records. He said, I'm an Olympic champion. I have a gold medal that has hung around my neck. He said, people f throughout the Soviet Union have called me a wonder of nature. And I was crouched over here, kind of holding my breath because I didn't know him all that well. And I said, Ooh, boy, what a conceited guy we brought here tonight. You know, what's he going to do next? And he said, I want you to know all of these things that have happened in my life are secondary in my life. He said, the most important thing in my life is my Christian faith. And then before he left, he said to those people this night, this is in a ballpark. I mean, this is before it's kind of, there was no baseball chapel or football chapel then. This was radical. And Paul said, if I'm the strongest man in the world and I can't get through one minute of my life without Jesus Christ as the centerpiece of my life, he said, how about the rest of you? And that was it. He walked off the field and he got a standing ovation. Many who saw Paul Anderson at their school or church were small children at the time. R.B. Lagrun was one such child who some 30 years later vividly remember seeing the strongest man on earth. For the first time, I saw Paul Anderson at East End Elementary School. That's in Greenwood, South Carolina, around the year 1963. I guess I was probably about 11 years old at that time. Uh, I guess the most amazing thing to me was the mere fact when we first originally saw Paul, uh, personally, I didn't think he could lift anything, you know, being honest with you. However, he proved us all wrong. As a child, you know, we, we tend to look through the small glass, so to speak, and he proceeded to the stage where they had the heavy, heavy weight, and he proceeded to squat, to lift the weight up, and he came all the way up, and all of the kids' eyes got big. You know, it was amazing. It was truly amazing. And then he went from there, too, after he, you know, rested for about, I guess, five or 10 minutes or so, uh, to I, what I call the headbutt with the blocks, and uh, he just busted his head, and the eyes got big again. You know, it was amazing again, you know. And then from there to the nail drive with the, you know, with his hand through the board. And uh, it was just, to me, incredible. I, I truly enjoyed that. I go, uh, not by face, I don't think as much as by size. If someone will say, well, who is the fellow there? And I'll say, oh, man, that's Paul Anderson, wait till you're as big. And uh, it just differs. My response has to do with the response of the person who, who would recognize me. And as a rule, someone comes up, are you Paul Anderson? And uh, yes, and, and uh, I love to be recognized naturally because all athletes do, especially old athletes. <laughs> but uh, I would... Uh, Creams in just a little bit because they say, are you Paul Anderson? Yes. And then they're going to say, uh, how much can you lift? And I've heard that 10 million times. So it's real refreshing if someone comes up and says, uh, are you Paul Anderson? Yes. Well, you know, I saw you uh, here, there, and the other, and I really enjoyed your Christian witness. And I appreciate that. And, and that's one of the greatest things there is about being recognized. I've always been taught that everything we have comes from God, and even before I was a committed Christian. I... Uh, I knew these things, and so I knew God had given me the strength and given me the ability because other people were as big as I was, even though I was a huge person. Other people had worked as hard, but I had the ability to build the strength. God had given me something special. So uh, I have uh, never been a humble person as far as, you know, the clod kicker is, uh, man, you know, this, that, and the other. I've always had the confidence and always felt that I could accomplish anything but I always uh, knew where any accomplishment I made came from, from Almighty God. Uh, being a patriot and speaking on patriotism a great deal, and being a Christian, sometimes I am asked, uh, do the two things conflict? Uh, being uh, very uh, patriotic to your country and, of course, loyal to God, 
because it's the God of the whole world. And, of course, my feeling on this and my answer to this is the fact that um, we've got to be loyal. You've got to be loyal to something. Uh, I always say that I, I think a great deal of Paul Anderson. In fact, I just love Paul Anderson. And loving Paul Anderson, I love other people. And I love my country. I love the United States of America. And loving America, I can love other countries. If I, if I would look down on my country and say that I would just, well, you know, like some would say today, be a citizen of the world, well, you see, you're not really loyal to anything. So I think that I can uh, love peoples of other lands because I love my land and uh, have uh, nothing to uh, be insecure about. Over the years, the youth home has had numerous changes and setbacks, but one thing that has remained constant is the home's dedication to the boys and its tremendous success. Their formula? Love, hard work and discipline, and the teaching of Christian values. How successful have they been? We searched out several of the graduates of the home, as well as several of those who believe in the home so much that they are willing to donate their time and money so that the Paul Anderson Youth Home can continue for years to come serving those in need of help. Our first interview was with Mr. and Mrs. Stuart Thompson, whose son Jim arrived at the Paul Anderson Youth Home in the back seat of a police car. Well, as I was saying, Jim was a problem since he was an infant. Uh, in second grade, he was diagnosed as being, he wasn't diagnosed, he was put in a behavioral disorder, disorder program and also placed on the target program, which is the accelerator program, and that was in second grade. School problems continued to worsen from there on out. They never got any better. By eighth grade, he was expelled four times. We even had to go to a meeting to keep him in school. They did not want to even keep him at school at all. They wanted to send him to a place where kids are that are totally unruly and cannot be kept in school. Um, Things got worse and worse to where he got in trouble with the law. First time he was picked up by the cops, he was only 13 years old. Uh, Jim was pretty much of a con artist. Uh, Judge Gober, who was one of probably the three or four judges that he was up against, has, had probably sized Jim up more than anybody has uh, from a legal end of it, said that he was the biggest con artist he'd ever met in his life that this was when Jim had just stolen the car. And it, he says, you've almost got me convinced that you didn't take that car. But says, these policemen said they pulled you out of it when you raked it. Things escalated. They got worse and worse to the point that he was stealing cars. And he was in drugs, and one thing and another, until we had to find help for him somewhere. We gave up. There was nothing else we could do. Um, Paul Anderson is, uh... He's a man that I respect and admire, and I, I really owe him a lot in my life because um, he really helped change my life. You know, before before I uh, came under his, you know, went to his school, um, I was high school dropout and uh, had a lot of problems and stuff. And now I'm in in college and I'm I'm doing better than I ever thought I would. And so my personal feelings about him are. Uh, just, I'm really just thankful that God put him in my life and, you know, that I was able to uh, be helped by his program and his ministry. Presently at Ellis Georgia College, and we'll be graduating uh, hopefully in December. Excellent grades. Uh, probably has his life together better than any 21-year-old uh, kid that I've seen. I'm proud of Jim, and uh, I'm proud of everything that he stands for. I plan on going to graduate school and going to uh, perhaps seminary and uh, becoming like a Christian counselor, you know, get my doctorate and, and working with, uh, with adolescents that have, have problems like my own, whether it be problems with drugs or alcohol or family or the law. So um, not only did he change my life for the better, but he also did, you know, give me a purpose and a direction. And, and just uh, a desire to help others in the same way that he helped me. I can't thank Paul and Glenda Anderson enough for what they've done. They've done it with the Lord's help, and they will tell you themselves that they didn't do it, the Lord did it, but 
they were his messengers. And they, he needed that help. We couldn't give it to him. Jim and I were probably the worst of enemies. And uh, we both let each other know that we really hated each other. And there was no secret about it. And that uh, Jim introduces me to his friends now. Is This is my best friend, but he also is my dad. And that's a great feeling to have. The youth home basically has, has taught me everything in, in my life that I use today. It's given me a, a real focus for my life here at North Georgia College today. And I think it fit, set a foundation, really, for my entire life, because I know that I would never be able to make it here at North Georgia College with everything that's going on around me if I had not had the youth home for my foundation, first of all. Paul Anderson, I feel like it was through him the Lord Jesus was really able to have a chance to work in my life, and it was through him that I had an opportunity uh, to be, accept Christ into my life, and through him that, that he put the staff there and the people that are there that that changed my life today. Uh. I didn't see Paul for the first month I was at the youth home, and it sort of got acclimated to the way things were, but when Paul did uh, eventually get a chance to talk to me, there was such a profound impact by the man. Um, and what he said that I, I still remember that day to this day, and will take that day with me for the rest of my life. Just the, the spiritualness, um, the self-confidence, the, um, there are just so many words that are in the English language that you can't describe it with. Uh, that day will always just be, be one of the best days in my life, you might want to say. He gives you such a, he comes across in such a way, uh, especially with, with the younger men, and that he has an influence on and He has such a strong influence on those people. When five minutes of meeting the man, your life has totally changed um, for the better. I, I can't say anything bad about Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson always gave you the right things to, to say. He always had the right answer. Uh, and I think that goes back to his closeness with, with the Lord. And, and the, that, that in itself, you can just see that radiating out of the man. I've had the opportunity that a lot of the students at the home now don't have. I got to play football with Paul on Sundays. We had touch football games. And I saw the strongest man in the world be the most gentle person that you could ever imagine possible. I do remember the first time I did something wrong and I uh, was asked to bend over and grab my ankles. and. I expected the worst, but what I got was punishment that I deserved, and that was all. For a man to be as strong as he was, to be so gentle and understanding of problems of society with youth, uh, with the things that we would face as we grew older and became adults and became people in the workforce, of America, became respectable citizens and responsible parents. It's truly amazing. Uh, everything that, that I have today, I honestly can say I owe to the values that were instilled by Paul and Glenda while living at the home. I think back what year it was, it was many years ago, maybe as, as long as uh, 35 years ago, I don't remember exactly, but I guess I passed uh, Paul Anderson on the expressway uh, heading towards Atlanta. And as I saw him riding that bicycle, it like, reminded me of an elephant being on a uh, bicycle. And fortunately, he stopped by my restaurant, which is located on 4119, and for a sandwich, and he came in and I believe that was the first contact I'd had with Paul Anderson, but I was impressed and to know that he was, uh, his intention was to pedal his bicycle to Father Flanagan's Boys Town to attract some attention about a boys home that he intended to start down in Vidalia. I remember my son keep telling about the story of him going to the hotel room to pick up Paul Anderson there 
and about him sitting there uh, in, in his room waiting for us, that he had a little New Testament in that huge hand of his. And uh, so my sons tell the story oftentimes about the strongest man sitting there reading this little New Testament, what an impact it made on their lives. And he has today, and they've always remembered that and had high respect for Paul Anderson. The first time I uh, made met Paul, uh, I was just absolutely taken back by the man. When you look into his eyes, you're looking into a man's eyes. And there's a power there that uh, has, has nothing to do with physical strength. It's just pure in the character. And one time I was sitting at a, a table uh, in there at the dining table in the hall there, and the boys were every uh, were bringing pie out, and they forgot pie, Paul's lemon pie. And with that booming voice of his, he ripped out, where's my pie? And before I knew it, I'd taken two steps towards the kitchen to get it for him myself. He's got that kind of power of his voice alone will uh, shake rafters. And, uh, and it's a, it's a God-given uh, trait for Paul. And, uh, and, it's, and it's been so much help in the home because he gives the father image to these boys that they need. He need, He's a discipline, and he admits he's a discipline. He said, Glenda handles the love, I handle the discipline, and that's... Uh... I've known Paul Anderson for a number of years. I met him first, I guess, a long time before I was elected governor, when he was still traveling the state and the nation on the speaking tour and, and doing physical demonstrations, and I was tremendously impressed with his physical strength, but I think I was more impressed with his spiritual strength and his physical strength has diminished over the years, but his spiritual strength has continued to grow and he's uh, been a wonderful witness for Christ. Well, I guess it's been almost 30 years now since uh, Paul and Glenda established the Paul Anderson Youth Home there in Vidalia. And of course, I was tremendously interested as governor for the uh, young people that uh, he would uh, uh, invite in and also that uh, he would serve there in that uh, Paul Anderson youth home and so he's turned a lot of lives around and it's a Christ-centered project and operation and of course uh, that has made it super successful. In early 1981 Paul's childhood bout with Bright's disease and the injuries he sustained in the 1954 car accident began to catch up with him when he began experiencing kidney stones and severe hip problems despite a six-week hospitalization to eliminate the stones by june of nineteen eighty two he had developed end-stage renal failure requiring dialysis pneumonia struck in march of nineteen eighty three and by may due to further complications it was decided that paul undergo a kidney transplant the donor was paul's sister dot johnson from Tacoa. ten months later paul's health had improved to the point that he was starting to walk on his own but once again, he faced a major setback when he fell and injured his lower spine. Late in the same year, his colon ruptured and the doctors gave him a 20% chance of survival. Even if he survived, doctors were afraid that the infections associated with the ruptured colon would certainly cause Paul to lose his transplanted kidney. Paul survived the ruptured colon as well as several other major illnesses since that time. And to present day continues to run and manage the Paul Anderson Youth Home with his wife, Glenda, defeating all the odds against him. Though confined to a wheelchair and having gone through some 10 years of constant pain and dozens of emergency operations, Paul Anderson has never wavered in his devotion to Jesus Christ. I personally feel that the champion athlete owes a great deal to God. Uh, no matter what he believes, he's still up the debt still there. Uh, he owes it to the young people to set a good example. I saw this uh, rebutted in some newspaper material not long ago saying uh, and several athletes were quoted that they didn't know anyone anything because it was their business what they did well I just don't agree with that because when uh, uh, 
you're given a gift, why it's being you, it should be used for something. I mean, it should be used to lead in the right direction because the doors are open wide, just as the Bible tells us, and and the door is even open wider. Uh, and uh, and wider and wider, the more uh, uh, famous you get for uh, at being a good athlete. In February of 1992, two weeks after having emergency surgery, Paul Anderson was flown into Orlando, Florida, where he was recognized as the strongest man of the century. According to Tom Ciola, the promoter of the first power and strength symposium ever held, there was never any question who should receive the award. We asked those interviewed throughout the country if they agreed with the symposium's choice. This is how they responded. If you could compare Anderson in his day with the, the well, let's call it scientific knowledge that they had then, compared to what scientific knowledge they have now, in the way of lifting weights, uh, nobody's going to come near the man. Nobody. Because yeah. he just, like people ever say, he was ahead of his time. Yeah. If he had the knowledge that they have nowadays in the way of lifting, uh, man, they'd, they'd never come close to it. Never. Uh, definitely in shoulder strength and leg strength, he had to be the strongest of all time. And as I say, comparing him to someone with more technical skills today in the clean and jerk, it would be very difficult to do that. But uh, I don't know of anyone that has squatted with more weight, and I've never heard of anyone that's uh, any closer, and he's very closely approached his uh, push press and 600 pounds. And not only once, but he did it three reps. Okay, when it comes to discussing who the uh, strongest man of all time might be, uh, Paul Anderson has to be at the top of the list because uh, the things he did early in his career before powerlifting was even organized, some of those records still stand to, to today, and uh, they've never been exceeded, and he doesn't have the advantage of the technique, the, uh, the equipment, and so forth that modern lifters use. So uh, particularly in, in terms of squatting, he's in a category by himself. He just can't be uh, compared to anybody. So when people ask me who the strongest man of all time is, I answer without any hesitation whatsoever, Paul Anderson. Just to give you an idea how some of the other notables in the Iron Game feel, let me read you a few experts. The late Harry B. Paschel, managing editor of Strength and Health magazine, called Paul Anderson the strongest man that ever lived. Jim McCarty, who was the only current elite in the 80s in both powerlifting and weightlifting, says that Paul Anderson was the greatest athletic strongman for his body weight that ever lived. His strength feats were unbelievable, but he may be an even greater humanitarian. Charles Frazier, writer for Muscle and Fitness magazine, said Paul Anderson is beyond doubt the strongest human being in world history. Larry Pacifico, who's a powerlifting legend, See, none of the day's powerlifters can even hold a candle to the power of Paul Anderson. Bill Kazmaier, who is the undisputed current world's strongest man, said Paul Anderson is the true king of strength. Kenny Cray, notable Iron Game authority, said if we had someone like Paul Anderson today, the USA would once again be on top in lifting. Ricky Crane. Ricky Crane is a current world record holder in the 165-pound class in the squat. Unbelievable, 755 pounds. He's a multinational world champion. He says a tribute to history's strongest man like this should have been done a long time ago. His influence and his humanitarian work with youth as a role model is unparalleled. As you have come to realize by now, the greatness of Paul Anderson flowed far beyond his weightlifting abilities and into the inner strength he has displayed in everyday life. Probably two of the closest people to Paul Anderson are his sister, Dot Johnson of Toccoa, Georgia, and his beautiful wife, Glenda. Let us listen to their feelings concerning the strongest man on earth. Since he has been in bad health, 
and he has had to limit his activities and he has had to accept his limitations he has proven to me that he is indeed one of the stronger people in the world because he has had such strength through all of this and he still shows strength to endure and persevere and go through this day by day and still keep the Paul Anderson Youth Home going. So I'm as proud, I'm prouder of him for this than for winning the gold medal and for anything else that he has done. By many people, Paul has been described as a gentle giant, and I think that is, um, I think it's an excellent description for him. He is, um, I, perhaps they probably meant, uh, as they described a giant, a person in stature and size. I think he's a giant of a man in his character and in who he is, his love for people, mostly his love for the Lord. Um, our boys through the years would probably tell you, uh, Sometimes he's not real gentle in that he is a leader. He's a strong leader. We believe that God gave him the ability to be a father image, father figure, not a buddy figure. Um, and because of that, I think he has the ability to be an authoritarian. And uh, so he speaks sometimes rather strongly, perhaps um, firmly. But within that, you feel love, nurturing, caring, and also there is that strength there of sec that provides security which i think is one of the gifts god's given him to do our work so as being a gentle giant he has a heart and a love for, for for young people for people in general at the same time what he says is the law in our in our family in our circumstance that doesn't mean that uh he and i don't make decisions together and we're not partners together but the ultimate decision falls on the shoulders of my husband he's my leader He's my security, and uh, I also think that that provides for me that giant of security that I need, and in that we uh, see what he has been to our young people as a father. Um, I've seen a gentleness in him that probably few, few people have ever seen, but I've seen the gentleness of um, a tear in his eye when he's seen someone hurt or when there's been concern over a fellow Christian who has stumbled and who's left the flock, uh, someone he's known who has been a godly man who has fallen away, and I've seen the heartbreak that is within him, the man, uh, over the loss of this soul. So yes, there's a gentleness, there's a, there's a kindness there that uh, often people don't see on the outside. In trying to find a proper ending to this documentary, I found myself at a total loss of words for ideas. I realized that Paul Anderson, the man, was not something that could be easily summed up in a neat little ending. After over a year of research, digging through volumes of old lifting magazines, and reel after reel of his most famous lifting competitions, and later his public appearances, I felt that nothing I might come up with would do justice to Paul Anderson. I thought that maybe after interviewing him in person I'd be better able to end the tape. All the interview did was convince me even more that Paul Anderson is indeed a true hero and that nothing I could come up with would be fitting. It was only after hearing a speech made in February of 1992 in Atlanta, Georgia that I knew I had my ending. The speech was made by Paul's daughter Paula Anderson Schaefer when she accepted on her father's behalf the prestigious Hall of Champions Award from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Over the last 10 or 11 years, my daddy's really suffered from many illnesses and it's really taken its toll on him. Um, he's lost his ability to lift great weight. He's lost his ability to walk. He is immunosuppressed, so he's not able to go outside very much. He has to stay indoors, and I've seen him suffer a great bit, and he tries to hide the suffering from me, but I, he has suffered. And But through all this, his faith has never wavered, and if you were to talk to him today, he would you would still realize that the greatest thrill in his life is being a Christian. 
and he knows where his strength comes from. And he might not be able to lift a table or drive a nail, but to me, he's still the world's strongest man. And it's not muscles that I'm referring to. It's a greater strength that, to me, is the greatest I've ever seen. And he's in my Guinness Book of Records. <laughs>